pour it out. You know, there's some things that the Lord will pour out in the last days that you want to be on the receiving end of. The Lord will also pour some things out in the last days that you don't want any part of. You don't want to be on the receiving end of. The Lord will pour his spirit out on those of his election. You certainly want to be on the receiving end of those, blex, those blessings. You know, God is going to give his elect exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. So don't get uptight. Don't become over anxious. If you worry, think back on what he did for Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. Gave them water out of a rock. Gave them manna from heaven. Remember that he did that for them. He's going to do the same for his election. Now the Lord will pour out the cup of God's wrath on the Lord's day. You don't want any part of the cup of God's wrath. Now I'm going to call on you to help me this morning. Anytime that I say the Lord said I will pour out this or that to someone or you, I'm going to pause and I'm going to give you the signal. And I want you to say, pour it out, Lord, pour it out. That's going to serve two purposes. One, you can go home and when you're listening to this recording, you can say to your friends and family who aren't here, there, did you hear me? <laughs> and if I have bored someone to the point that they've kind of nodded off, boy, is that gonna wake them up. Shall we try it one time? The Lord said, I will pour my spirit of grace and supplication out on Jerusalem. By Jove, I think you've got it. <laughs> Let's begin our study this morning in the book of Proverbs. Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. As we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Now the Proverbs, if you translate it, is mashal. And you could think of it as divine rules for receiving God's blessings. Do you want God's blessings? Well, listen up. We're about to study mashal. Written by the wisest of all in the flesh, other than Jesus Christ, Solomon. Again, we ask that word of wisdom in Jesus' precious name, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding. Now Solomon had a pretty good handle on wisdom. You know why? 1 Kings chapter 3, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And he said, ask what you will of me, Solomon. What did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom to rule this so great a nation as Israel. And the Lord said, you know, because you didn't ask for riches or the head of your enemies or long life, I'm gonna add all those things on to you and give you the wisdom you requested. Verse three, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. If you have that, you know how to do things right intuitively, to give subtlety, that's discretion, to the simple, simple you could translate seducible, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And if you gain those things, you become not seducible. Verse five, a wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Apply God's word to your life beloved. Listen to what that scripture just said. If you want to be a house builder, seek out the best house builder in your area and seek a job with him because you'll learn how to become a good house builder from the best. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark 
sayings, better translated, deep sayings. Verse 7, the fear or reverence of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know, that's your first step in your walk with your Heavenly Father, recognizing that reverence of Him is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, until you're old enough to take a spouse and start your own family, there's probably no one that is more concerned about your welfare than your father and your mother. Listen to them. They will give you good advice most of the time. There are exceptions, and I understand that, but most of the time you can count on it. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head or to your mind and chains about thy neck. Their instruction and in the law of your mother will be locked in and with you for your life. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Sinners today try to turn things upside down. They say what's wrong is right, and what is right is wrong. They say homosexuality, homosexuality is okay with God now. No, it isn't. God's Word has always said and always will say homosexuality is an abomination. That's the way it is. I'm sorry if you don't like that. Perhaps you need to consider your lifestyle and make some changes. Don't go in the way of sinners. Verse 11, if they say, the sinners, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. That's to premeditate murder. Let us lurk privily or private for the innocent without cause. They could care less about other people. Verse 11, let us, this being the sinners, swallow them, the innocent, up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. And that's their destination, the lake of fire, unless they change their ways. Don't let them drag you into the pit with them. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. That's what the sinners say. Cast in thy lot among us, and let us all have one purse. One purse is socialism. Have you heard of the new green deal? We're going to make sure everybody has a college education paying job, whether they have a college education or not. We're going to provide them health care, whether they work or not. We're going to give them a college education. You know, all those things are not bad things. But my question is, who is going to pay for that? Oh, well, we'll just tax the rich some more. Let me tell you, the rich usually are the ones that own businesses. The businesses are the ones that provide jobs for people. So you can't build on that foundation. It just won't stand. Socialism will not work. Verse 15, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. They're going down the wrong path. They're walking the wrong way. You know the way that you should walk, the way that Jesus Christ walked. Verse 16, for their feet run to evil. Not only are they going the wrong way, the wrong path, they run to evil and make haste to shed blood. That's to commit murder. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. The net is spread for them. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. They get caught in their own traps. You know, King David often uh, asked God in the Psalms that his enemies should be caught in their own snares, their own traps. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's someone who's rich with ill-gotten gains. The lesson there is you've got to get rid of those ill-gotten gains or you can forget about the kingdom of God. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Will you listen? Will you answer when wisdom calls? She crieth in the chief place of concourse. This word concourse means commotion or tumult. In the openings of the gates, you know what happened in the gates, that's where they had the courts at this time. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, this is wisdom speaking, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, that's foolishness, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. That was a really weak. <laughs> I will pour out my spirit on you. Pour it out, Lord, pour it out. Very much better, thank you. I will make known my words unto you. You know, his word tells us how to be pleasing to him. We should study his word. And you know, if you don't have wisdom, what does James chapter one, verse five tell you? If any of you lack wisdom, ask. That's all you have to do is ask. And the Father will give it to you liberally is what it says. God encourages us to remind him of the promises he made to us in Isaiah. He also promises that his election, that he will give you what you need when you need it. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 43 and be a little more awake on the pouring out. <laughs> Isaiah 43. Let's pick it up with verse 25. And it reads, the Lord speaking. I, even I, for emphasis, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Who is able to blot out your sins? There's only one entity. It's your heavenly father. And if you think about it another way, that's saying salvation is his to give. No one else's. And you know, try as they might, man has always tried to create their own salvation. It began in, in Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Babylon, 200 years after Noah's flood. They said, oh, if there's another flood, we better build a stairway that we can climb up the Tower of Babylon. Today, it's cloning, cryogenics. There is only one salvation, it is Jesus Christ. Verse 26. Put me, the Lord speaking, in remembrance. Remind me of the promises I've made to you. Let us plead together. Let us reason together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Repent and ask for his forgiveness. He's the only one who can forgive you. Thy first father have sinned. I think this is referring to Jacob. And thy teachers have transgressed against thee. Most of you with reference Bible have a note on teachers as interpreters or translators. You know, if you're unable to translate the original manuscripts yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. But know who's doing your translating. I'll tell you what, there are people who are desperate to change the Strong's to Concordance to where you don't know that the Kenites are the sons of Cain. We have to watch them like a hawk. You should watch those who do your translating as a hawk as well. Some of them will deceive you. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to reproaches. Amos chapter six, verse 14, I will raise up a nation against you and they will, shall afflict you from the entering in of Hemath. Most of you know Hemath, who is from there, the Kenites. 
Verse 44, we continue. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. It isn't too late yet. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Do you need God's help? Boy, I sure do. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jeshurun is the same with an H. J-E-S-H-U-R-U-N that you find in the Song of, Mo- uh, Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. That's Israel is a pet name God gave Israel when they're fat, dumb, and sassy. When life is a little bit too good for them and they start saying, look what I did with my two hands instead of thanking God for his many blessings. Verse 3, sharpen up for me. For I will pour out water upon that him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. That's your children. And you know, the USA is blessed. Are we perfect? (laughs) No, far from perfect. I tell you, I've traveled quite extensively uh, internationally, and I have yet to find a place that I would rather live than in the United States of America. In fact, is I, I would be a proponent of paying for every senior in high school to go for a week to a third world country to experience what they have compared to what we have, and I think we'd have a whole lot of less discontentment among our young, be that as it may. Verse four, and they, your offspring, shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses, that's rivers and streams. In other words, they'll, they'll thrive and prosper. One of your children shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, the 12 seed line, all 12 tribes. And another shall subscribe, that means to write, with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Today we surname ourselves Christ men, Christians. Verse six, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. You know, that's the beginning of true worship, is acknowledging that there is only one God, and he is the creator of heaven and earth. In Revelation 22, verse 13, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the first and the last. And who as I, the Lord continues, shall call and shall declare it, no one, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, even in the first earth age, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Prophecies of God always come to pass, just exactly as they're spoken or written. Prophecies of false teachers seldom come to pass. God knows the future. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, from the ancient time? And he declared it, he declares it in his word. Have you read it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, I know not any. This last word, God, check it out, is in the Hebrew, rock. I mentioned the Song of Moses a minute ago, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. We learn that God is our rock. Deuteronomy 32, 31, also in the Song of Moses, it states their rock is not our rock. There are two rocks, one the Antichrist, one the Lord. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable or desirable things shall not profit. 
and they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. My mother's first uh, most famous, or I should say her favorite scripture in the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 states, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's how you be not ashamed. Ashamed means confused. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? You know, they draw eyes on them, but they can't see. They draw ears on them, but they can't hear. They draw a mouth on them, but they can't speak. They're profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen they are of men, not God. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they, all, they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. God promises he will pour out his spirit of grace on Jerusalem in Zechariah. Turn with me the, next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 12, we're going to pick it up with verse 9. Zechariah 12, 9, and it reads, And it shall come to pass in that day. What day are we talking about? We're talking about the Lord's day, the millennium. That I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Only one king and one kingdom at that point in time. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They didn't just pierce him, they crucified him. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. He was one's only begotten son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And you note the star at the end of that verse. That means that 99% of biblical scholars agree that that is talking about the Messiah. And it is. And they will mourn when they realize that they have rejected Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. They didn't accept him. They crucified him. In that day, what day? The Lord's day. Shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadarimun in the valley of Megiddon. Megiddo, as you know, the gathering place of Satan and his. On the Lord's day, they're going to have reason to mourn all right. They're going to have reason to be shaking in their boots. And the land shall mourn every family apart. This apart means by itself the family of the house of David apart, Judah, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. Many believe this Nathan was the prophet Nathan. I don't. Many of you with reference Bibles, you have a reference to Luke 3.31, which is where we learn the seed line of Christ, which was Nathan was the son of David through which Messiah came the family of the house of Levi apart. We had the house of David, Judah. Here we have the house of Levi. That's the seed line of Christ. Mary's father was Heli, Luke chapter 3, of Judah. And her mother was of the daughters of Aaron, a Levite, in other words. And their wives apart. And the family of Shimei, I believe this is Simeon, the tribe of Israel, apart and their wives apart all the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. Again, that's all saying that they're going to be mourning when they realize that they crucified Christ rather than accept him. Verse 13, in that day, we're talking future, not so distant future, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. We learn in Revelation 22, which is actually at the after the millennium, at the beginning of the eternity, we'll have that fountain coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. 
and the two trees of life on either side with leaves for healing. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets, these are the false prophets, and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Judgment begins at the pulpit. First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 17. They are going to get what they have coming. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, that's meaning falsely, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. This is very much of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. The Lord says there that if any prophesies in my name when I didn't command him, or prophesies in the name of other gods, he will be put to death. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision. Ashamed means confused. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. A rough garment is a hairy garment, such as Elijah wore. They're not even going to be able to put on the pretense of pretending like they're a true prophet of God, is what this is saying. Sharpen up for me. But he shall say, I am no prophet. Or, I am no preacher. I am an husbandman. I'm a farmer. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. You know, some see the big GP in the sky. In this guy's case, it did mean go plow. He said that it meant go preach falsely. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? You remember the one who was pierced in verse 10 of the previous chapter? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Again, the star indicating this referred to Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Messiah. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 states there that those who pierced his hands are going to see him returning at the second advent. And boy, are they going to be shaken in their boots. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. In Mark chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus tells the apostles, All of you will be offended because of me this night and they will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. You want to be a part of that third that's left therein, because there are going to be a lot of people that are spiritually dead at that time. And they're going to remain that way for the thousand years of the millennium. Revelation chapter 20 tells us as such. Two-thirds spiritually dead. We do have the millennium. Hopefully that number won't be that high at the end of the millennium. And I will bring the third part, that's you, beloved, through the fire. And will refine them as silver is refined. Get rid of the slag. What's useless? And will try them as gold is tried. That, that's to purify them. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. They'll call on his name, not the name of the Antichrist. And I will say, it is my people, Ami, in the Hebrew tongue. Not lo Ami, which is not my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. You know, the object of the Lord's day, I want you to grab a hold of this, is mercy. And yeah, there's some tough things going to happen on the Lord's day. That cup of wrath is going to be poured out. But you know what? Some children 
need a little stronger discipline than others to get their attention. And some of those that receive the cup of that wrath are liable to say, hey, I don't want any more of that. I'm going to straighten up and fly right. The Lord promised that he would pour out, pour out his spirit on all flesh. Scripture you all are very familiar with. I want to go there, though. We need to remind ourselves of this. Acts chapter 2, as we continue our study on pour it out. Now, I want you to listen to what God's Word says. Not the traditions of men. Because if you listen to the traditions of men, they're going to tell you that this chapter is about speaking an unknown tongue that you have to have an interpreter to interpret what the person is saying. Listen to God's Word. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, They were in all with one accord in one place. The 12 apostles were all together on Pentecost. Pentecost simply means the 50th. And that we're at the 50th day after the crucifixion. Sharpen up for me. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of the rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting I want you to lock on to that verse, beloved. Would you like to receive a sign that the Holy Spirit is about to speak through you? You just got it from God's Word. A sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. We're going to be talking about that this evening a little more, so be sure and hang on to that verse for me. And there appeared, appeared is a weak word here in the translation. It should be to gaze with wide open eyes as at something remarkable. And when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, it is truly going to be something remarkable. And unto them cloven tongues, more than one, like as of fire, our Father is a consuming fire. It sat upon each of them. Now have we... Had any language that no one understands yet? No? Haven't heard a word about somebody not being able to understand something and need an interpreter. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. This word in the Greek is glosse. By implication, it means to uh, a language, specifically one not uh, uh, unacquired. And that means that You didn't learn it in your home. You learned it by going to school or traveling to a foreign country and immersing yourself in that language. As the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Holy Spirit gave them words, don't premeditate what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance. That means words tell you what to say. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, people of Judah, devout men out of every nation under heaven. They they represented every language in the world. Now, when this, the cloven tongues, was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. That means they were troubled in mind because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, if we had anything unknown or that needs an interpreter yet, no. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? They all speak the language of the Galileans. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, uh, wherein we, the county wherein we were born. In other words, It's not only going to be the same language, it's going to be the same accent or dialect. I've traveled Germany and they have like five or six different dialects. If you learn one of the dialects and you go to a a region where they speak another dialect, you have trouble understanding what they say because it's totally, almost totally different. But it's going to be down to the county in which they were born. Parthians, these are people from India. 
and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, Turkey of today, and in Judea and Cappadocia, this is Asia Minor, in Pontus and Asia, the Orient, Phrygia, that's Asia Minor also, and Pamphylia in Egypt, the Arabs, and in parts of Libya, northern Africa, and Cyrene, also in Africa, and strangers, this is foreigners of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. Cretes, that's the largest of the Greek islands, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Have you ever wondered what the Holy Spirit is gonna speak through you? I think you just learned. The wonderful works of God. And I mean, don't premeditate, but I believe that's, this is, a, this is our type. This is our example of what it's gonna be like when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, God's election, when you're delivered up. Grasp and absorb every kernel of it that you can. The, from the noise from heaven I'm talking about, the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? They're thinking, how could this be? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. New wine is party time in Germany. When the new wine comes in, the new wine is known to go to your head more quickly than normal wine. Always you have that few, the mockers in a group. The reason we came here, but Peter standing up with the 11, the other uh, apostles, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's only 9 a.m. for goodness sake. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel chapter two, verse 28. We're going there in a minute. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. Peter didn't say this, God said this. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This means to speak under inspiration, divine inspiration. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. What, women speaking for God? That's what it just said. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. You could translate prophesy, teach. And oh, God has never done that before. What about Huldah? What about Deborah? What about the four virgin daughters of Philip? All prophetesses. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Pour out, Lord, pour out. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. On Pentecost Day, 1981, Mount St. Helens blew. I know you've seen pictures of it. It's happening. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. We had a super blood moon earlier this year. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on his name, the, the name of the Lord shall be saved. The object of the Lord's day, mercy. And you know what? That's the reason we work so hard. We, we want to pull every single one of our brothers and sisters out of that lake of fire that we possibly can. Whatever it takes, that's what we're going to do. Said Joel, the words of the prophet. Let's go there as we conclude. Joel chapter 2, verse 21. If you find the book of Dan, you'll find a little short minor prophet, Hosea, then you'll have Joel. Joel chapter, the whole book of Joel tells us about that locust army of Revelation chapter 9. We're going to be speaking 
about that army uh, this evening in more detail. Let's pick it up, Joel 2, 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. And this is after the locust army. So what does this tell us? The locust army really aren't locusts. They're men. Again, we're going to be talking about that more this evening. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. I want you to take this word moderately out. It means according to righteousness. In other words, you're going to receive the former and the latter rain from God according to your righteousness. What do you deserve? What have you earned? And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. This is speaking of the former and latter rain of Deuteronomy chapter 11, that former rain that causes seeds to germinate and a plant to spring up. The latter rain being that that brings the, the fruit, the, the fruit, to, excuse me, the plant to maturity where it can produce fruit. Verse 24, and the floors, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Think spiritually for me. This, is, this means that there's going to be so much truth, there's going to be enough truth to go around. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army. These are the stages of the uh, locust maturity. And who did it say? My great army, which I sent among you. That's the Lord speaking. The Lord controls the northern army. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied Amos chapter 8 verse 11 tells us the famine of the end time is not for bread and water, but for hearing the word of God. How are you being fed? Many are starving to death. I don't know about you, but I'm being fed very, very well by my heavenly Father. We've eaten plenty and we're satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously. Wait a minute. We read in Acts chapter 2 what the utterance that the Holy Spirit gave the apostles was. What did they speak? The wonderful works of God. And here we say, He hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Those who worship the Antichrist will. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am, I am that I am, Ia Asha Ia the Lord your God and none else, and my people, Ami, shall never be ashamed. 28, and it shall come to pass afterward, after the Antichrist and the locust army have been here, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Pour out, Lord, pour out. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Does that sound familiar? It should, we just read it in Acts chapter two. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Verse 32 to conclude, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be saved. And in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Many were called before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. The object of the Lord's day, mercy. God didn't want to destroy any of his children. 
He wants them to be saved. Many of you have a destiny. You have been called. You were chosen before the foundations of the earth. You know, when God pours out His Spirit on all flesh, we better be in a receiving mode to absorb that Holy Spirit. This evening's message is soak it up. I think you already know what it's about. Let's go to His throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your written Word, Father. Your Word that tells us Your plan, Your will, Father. Let everything that we do be the honor and glory of Your name this weekend and a reflection of the love of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Now, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, it's very clear uh, that Cain did not offer the first fruits of his offerings where Abel did offer the first fruits, which uh, not offering the first fruits is an indication of no love. Uh, Arizona, this is Kega, Keegan, I think it is, K-E-E-G-A-N from Arizona, and Keegan is in the seventh grade. Dear Pastor Murray, after we're done with our physical bodies and our spiritual bodies in our spiritual bodies only, will gaining full recollection mean that we will remember ourselves from the first world age? Thank you for your attention and all the work you and your staff do. Well, you're quite welcome, young lady, and we're glad you enjoy studying God's Word. That's a very good question, too. And, and yes, I think we will uh, not only remember what we did here on Earth in the second Earth age, I think our, our intellect will be sufficient that we'll be able to recall what we did in the first Earth age. You know, part of what uh, were judged on uh, when the great white throne judgment uh, comes about, I can't help but believe we'll take in both this earth age and the first earth and heaven age. Um, it would not be fair for God to judge someone for something that they have no memory of. God is always fair. And thanks for your question, Keegan, and uh, you keep studying God's word. We're proud of you. Steve from Pennsylvania, I am reading the book of Romans, and as I read chapter 1, it is as I'm seeing the world today. Do you agree? Yes, uh, especially in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, when it describes same-sex sexual relationships and uh, same-sex marriage, if you will. And yeah, it reminds me a lot of what is going on in the world today, and that's not a good thing in God's eyes. It's an abomination uh, for homosexuality. Lori in Tennessee, is the Antichrist Satan or a man? Antichrist is Satan in one of his roles. And Satan never has been born in the flesh, never will be born in the flesh. He will be in a spiritual body. Uh, again, we offer that free CD, Mark of the Beast. I encourage you to order it because it goes in a lot about the Antichrist. 
Laura in Mississippi, does God answer a sinner's prayer? Good question. Um, arguably, the worst king of Judah was a man by the name of Manasseh. Uh, he caused the streets of Jerusalem to run with innocent blood. He prayed to God and God heard his prayer. You can document that in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. If you have an Apocrypha, uh, there's a book in the Apocrypha uh, called The Prayer of Manasseh. But uh, again, ar arguably the worst king of Judah uh, prayed and God heard his prayer. So God does hear the prayer of sinners. <clears throat> Mark from Texas Zechariah 14, 4, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. <coughs> Excuse me, what is Azal? Well, Azal is a place for God's election uh, to go and find uh, a safe haven, if you will, when Jesus Christ returns and his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives. Um, Azal, if you translate it, means uh, separate or select. And again, it's a place for God's election to go when the, the, the Master returns. Shirley, and I don't know where Shirley's from, Shirley asks, are there modern day prophets at the church there are people who come in the name of a prophet, prophet so-and-so. They call people out of the congregation and prophesy to them. For example, you will move into a new home in three days. Your child is coming home uh, or your husband is on the way. This sounds like fortune telling to me please help. It sounds a lot like fortune telling to me as well, Shirley. Um, beware of anyone who claims to be a modern day prophet. Do we have prophets? You bet. We've got Isaiah, we've got Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the minor prophets. Uh, their prophecies, many of them have yet to come to pass, but they will, uh, just as all prophecies of God. This sounds like somebody trying to come up with some way to draw more people to church. Uh, if they just teach God's word, uh, they probably would have to turn people away from their church, but instead they're playing games with um, hocus pocus tricks of prophecy. I'll leave it at that. Martin in Washington State. I am confused about who to pray to. I believe in the Trinity in the New Testament. The disciples asked Jesus how to pray uh, to Father. Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer, giving Father the glory. Are we just to pray to Father or can we pray to both separately? Please let me know. And uh, Martin, you're right in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, verse 9, the disciples asked Christ, how do we pray? And he said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, you pray to your heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with praying in Jesus' name. In fact, is you should pray in Jesus' name if you are a Christian, uh, documenting that you are. Deborah in Virginia I enjoy watching your program. I have learned so much. My son passed away 10 years ago from a drug overdose. <clears throat> I would like to know if he could or would go to heaven. Well, we're sorry for your loss. Um, I quoted Ecclesiastes chapter 12, uh, verses six and seven earlier that states, well, when we die, the flesh returns to the earth the Spirit returns to God. So uh, at this point in time, everyone has returned to heaven with God. No one is dead as far as their spirit 
is concerned. <coughs> the great white throne judgment, excuse me for my cough, uh, the great white throne judgment which occurs at the end of the millennium is when judgment is made as to whether someone goes into the eternity or whether that's the kingdom of God or they go into the lake of fire never to be thought of again. God is the judge. Uh, he will be the one who decides whether your son uh, goes into the kingdom or into the lake of fire. Mary from Tennessee, I'm 82 years old, well God bless you, and have loved my pets dearly over the years. Some have passed away. Will my beloved pets know me in heaven? Well, we certainly know from Isaiah chapter 11 that in the spirit world, which Isaiah 11 is there, that's the reason that the wolf uh, can lie down with the lamb. <clears throat> Most often misquoted, the lion lays down with the lamb. It's the wolf. Uh, but in Isaiah 11, we have animals that are in spiritual bodies. <clears throat> yes, to your question, there will be animals in the spirit life. Very possibly you will know your pets. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You like to make a little time each day to spend studying your Father's letter to you, the Bible. You know what? It makes Father's Day and makes Him very happy when you do that. <clears throat> He's going to bless you for doing it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing, though, that's most important, beloved, <clears throat> that's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.